Joe needs no introduction. You know him from JoeTrippy.com and his blog and the Dean campaign and the Edwards campaign and a lot of other campaigns. So Too many. Too many. Um, so basically, I think we want to start where a lot of the conversation has been for the last two days. If you were taking charge of the White House, change.gov, or anything else you can think of, uh, you know, what would you do, what would you ask for, what would you want from the president-elect uh, and the team, and how would you try to engage supporters both politically and in the process of governance? Well, I don't, I don't know that I do. I mean, first of all, I think they're doing a pretty good job at the start, so it's not uh, uh, so much what I do. I just think that the tools have never been used before. I mean, I really believe that this is, you know, John F. Kennedy sort of brought in the television presidencies. 60, 1960, and it's, you know, gone on for 40, 50 years, 48 years now. And um, this is going to be the first, you know, wired, connected, interactive, whatever you want to call it, presidency, and we don't know. Um, you know, just like a lot of the tools didn't exist, YouTube uh, didn't exist, you know, in 2004, there are going to be tools that these guys are going to develop, uh, you know, during the presidency that are going to be pretty amazing. So, I, I mean, I think the, the one thing I think the mistake is to think of this as just the White House. I mean, what's wrong with um, citizens able to report directly when they think they see a corporation polluting to the EPA? Uh, I mean, there's sort of like, uh, you know, I mean, so, I mean, so everything from the EPA all the way to the White House, all the way over to, um, you, you know, to other departments, it can be a whole revamp of how people actually participate in their government, not just the YouTube uh, radio address, address uh, kind of thing that we've seen already in change.gov, but how do you, how do you co create a collaborative government in which the people are actually participating and use the tools that are out there now plus what, what can be built to actually not just, I, I, people keep talking about the 13 million um, people that these guys brilliantly cultivated and helped uh, and those people uh, create this, but you know when the President of the United States stands there in the inaugural and ask the American people to engage and work with him to pass the, an agenda to better the country, I don't think it's going to be 13 million. I, mean, think, I think it's going to grow to grow pretty exponentially. I mean, if you imagine John F. Kennedy saying, you know, ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what you could do for your country. If you had these tools at the moment he said those words, what would have happened? And you have someone um, with 13 million signed up already, if he, you know, he's going to say something like that in this inaugural address. I think millions of Americans who did not sign up in a competitive sort of campaign and candidacy are going to want their president to succeed, want their country to succeed, and want to be part of that. Now what do you do with the 30 or, I mean, I think it could be incredibly millions more than we've seen now. And then how do you create the collaborative uh, government? Again, like I said, not just the White House, I think we focus too much on that, but the EPA, the, the um, uh, you know, energy, uh, you know, how people have ideas about how to solve some of these problems that we have and how those percolate up, up within departments and within um, uh, cab cabinet departments and are used to, uh, I mean, one of the things that I think both campaigns, the Dean campaign and I think the Obama campaign um, and a lot of campaigns that have used these you know, had these millions of people or hundreds of thousands of people sign up with them is that how quickly you realize that the headquarters isn't as smart as the 650,000 people that were out there in the Dean campaign or the 13 million people that were out. They see things that you can't see. They're, they, you, know, you can't be everywhere at one time and neither can the government. So I'm actually pretty excited, but I don't, I'm not going to you know, sit here with a prescription of uh, this much you know, video and this much that and these kind of tools. The one thing I would say is that, um, you know, I think they could do some really cool video stuff, which is not just, I mean, why, the networks are only going to give the president 30 minutes every time there's some kind of big problem or every so often. And, um, you know, in a five minute radio address is all you're going to get on the radio. There's no reason you can't do a 30 minute uh, YouTube address to the nation anytime you want. And well, let me ask you about the, what about media. doing what about doing that in crisis? I mean, with John Edwards, we saw when he came under fire uh, after the campaign ended, 
you know, for the allegations around his sex life, he chose to go and do a traditional media interview and sit there and get pelted with questions right. and, and try to deal with that. Would, would, do you think he should have, or in the future might you advise someone to say, you know, if the issue is between you and your supporters, uh, you should just upload a video and do one-way communication? Should Barack Obama use one-way communication when he's under fire and crisis, or does he still owe more of an interaction with questions in the press? No, I mean, look, I think you could, look, there's, there's certainly a way to have millions of Americans on a site populate uh, questions, I mean, basically po put questions forth and then have, um, uh, you know, rating system in which the top 10 questions of the million, you know, that millions of Americans move all the way to the top and in the press conference just answer the 10 questions that the American people, you know, that 30 million, 40 million, 13 million Americans asked. Well, I'll uh, just interrupt, on change.gov, there's the issue right, right now where that's happening, but community members are flagging questions about the Illinois governor as inappropriate. So some of those questions are being pushed down. I mean, how do you do the community norm on that? Do you have a position on that? Well, no, I, I think that that's what the press secretary, the communications director is there to do. I don't mean that, you know, it's not necessarily he is the president of the United States. You're answering the questions that are important. I'm not for censoring them or flagging them, but, uh, but I think what's, what would be, what I think would be cool is answering the top 10 questions that are part of the community and having the press do the follow-up. Mm -hmm. In other words, so you don't get a pass. I mean, you can't get a pass because there's no one there right at that moment, unless you're going to do a live blog or something where somebody can, or a live th thing. But I, my, my own view is populating the questions up, literally walking out there and instead of Helen Thomas asking the first question, the first question is a citizen who, you know, 12 million people said that's the question we want answered. Maybe it is Bogoyevich who, fine, answer the question. And then the follow-up, you know, if, 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 if that's where the press, com press comes in. If, if the Post wants to do a follow-up to, to that answer, that's where they, they would come in. But I think that might be a far more interesting way than having, you know, who, you know whoever it is, you know, D David Gregory or somebody ask the question that we all know is going to get asked. And, uh, you know, and it doesn't really, it's not really something anybody else gives a damn about, so. Do you think the press is more receptive to playing that role no, adjoining with citizens? No, they would be, no, it would like, I think, <laughs> I think they would be, I think they would be really pissed off, but I still, I don't know what the argument is, right? I mean, what, somehow you're the vessel of 15, you want to think you're representing million, million what are you, the, the readers of maybe the New York Times? I mean, even if you want to do that leader, that readership, it's nowhere near the, the community that, that, that I think, it, it, by the way, I think, again, looking at this in the context of what I think is going to happen, millions more Americans joining their president, not joining candidate Obama like 13 million did, but joining their president in, in participating in their democracy in the president's agenda, I think that could easily grow to some, you know, 20, 30, you know, million, and I don't know where, you know, I'm not going to predict how big or how small it's going to be, it's going to be, I think, much bigger than 13 million over time. And that I don't understand how you can argue that some member of the press has more insight as to how many million, that many millions of Americans who want to know about, what, and if it's Bogoyevich. First of all, if that is what's going on, the president and his people should know that that many million of Americans want an answer to that question. Whether they're going to flag them and push them down or not, that I don't believe that, I think you should let it, you know, you should answer what the top question is. But I'm saying that even if they decided not to, it's, I think it's better for the democracy and the president to understand there are people who want, want an answer to that question. So mm -hmm. I think in that way, it's, it'll, it'll be a better thing. So and while we're on the press, I want to look from 04 to 08. Uh, yeah. And I want to do it with a 50 cent quote. I know you're a big 50 Cent fan, right? I am a big 50 Cent yeah, fan. Yeah, so this is the right way to yeah. do it. You know, 50 Cent, when talking about his evolution from being an underdog to being a big star to then being attacked a lot, he said, well, that's fine. That's just entertainment. And the history of entertainment is building up entertainers so you can tear down entertainers for the sake of entertainment. And it seems like the more that politics is covered like entertainment, the more accelerated and vicious we see that cycle for at least some people in politics. And you can combine that out not only for the politicians, but also 
their movement or their supporters. And a huge distinction I see between 04 and 08 is that when Howard Dean was taken down, and it's a complex story that people know, right, but one facet of it was the media not only really coming down hard on him, but coming down hard on the entire thing he built. I remember feeling really angry at seeing so much activism and volunteering and work that should be good almost wherever it is located on the spectrum as just totally dissed. Um, and yet what we saw even early on, even before it was clear how well Obama would do, I think we saw a very different presentation of his supporters and his activists uh, from the traditional media. A, do you agree? B, why do you think we've seen that shift? And C, does it matter for, for building a participatory political process? Uh, I mean, yeah, that shift happened to it matters, but the reason it ma it's not un something we haven't seen in politics before. Um, often, um, you know, Gary Hart got caught with Donna Rice, right, in 88. Uh, four years later, uh, and he, dro he got dropped out of the race in three, four days. Uh, I was his deputy political director <laughs> and, and became Lee Hart's chief of staff the morning that the news broke about, about Donna Rice, and we lasted about four days. Um, I think there was a real uh, catharsis about what that kind of stuff meant in our politics. Here was a guy, by the way, in 1987, this is when this happened, Gary Hart was campaigning saying that, um, uh, that our whole entire defense and intelligence thing was all messed up, that it was geared towards mega wars with Soviets or, or, the, or the Chinese, and that that wasn't the threat anymore. The threat was third failed states and terrorism, and that we had to slim down, make our defense and units and intelligence units uh, slimmer, smaller, faster, more nimble, and have better intelligence to avoid third failed party third failed third world states with with terrorist groups that would be organizing against the United States. It's 1987. The guy saw uh, the the 9/11 um, before. You know, I mean, decades before 9/11 happened, he went out the window because of the Donna Rice problem, mess. I think people really focused on that. Thought after a couple, after a year, how stupid it was that that. I mean, that maybe there should have been at least some glimpse into this guy's campaign longer than four days before he got shoved out the window. So in 1992, when another guy running for president with Paula Jones and Jennifer Flowers chasing him around right before New Hampshire, it doesn't work the same way. He actually, the country takes his pause, they look at it, they may not like what they're saying, but let's hear what this guy has to say, he goes on to become president. It's very often in presidential politics that um, what's laughed at or scorned um, or misunderstood the next time around is looked at completely differently. And I think in retrospect, as people looked at um, the Dean campaign and uh, a lot of what, a lot of the innovation that occurred in it and a lot of the activism that occurred in it, uh, people who laughed, once laughed and said it was a spar scene out of Star Wars, uh, weren't laughing anymore. And the big mistake of 2006, 2007, my, my belief was there was one campaign, there are se co several campaigns, but one campaign in particular, the, the Obama campaign. One, because in my view, he was a community organizer, so he understood bottom up in a way that uh, a lot of candidates do not. Um, Howard Dean was one of the most courageous people I've ever met and ever worked for, but he wasn't, he didn't come up from a community organizer thing, wasn't natural to him. Um, but they understood that this was, that that wasn't some fad, some, there was something, ha you know, and they, and not only that, they felt it in their bones, and a lot of the people like Joe and others that, that worked in it were, you know, were, were really some of the top people in the country uh, had helped build the thing and make it happen with, with Dean were there. And, um, and another campaign, the Clinton campaign, I think, my own view, had very smart people, but the top of the campaign at lip service. They did not really believe that, that there was some new, different way to let people have some ownership of the campaign and use these tools to decentralize and do, do amazing things and, um, and paid the price for it. That, I think that decision alone is part, you know, and there are 
sort of wanting that, you know, they were the 30 smartest people in the world at the top of the Clinton campaign. And a lot of them are friends of mine. I'm not trying to put them down. Really, really was sort of the last, the last bastion of the people who said it's a star, bar scene out of Star Wars. Instead of embracing it as, look, this is a really powerful thing that can bring uh, change and to get people participating in their democracy again. And the tools that those guys built and the way they used them was stuff that you couldn't have possibly envisioned in 2000. I mean, first of all, some of the, like I said, didn't exist. YouTube did not exist. Um, Will I Am, I mean, it made, had nothing to do, some of the stuff that had nothing to do with actually inside the campaign. He wasn't even a hologram yet. Wasn't a hologram, it no, couldn't have he happened. Was just a real person. But I mean, it couldn't have, it couldn't have um, you know, having millions of people watch the, the race speech all the way through, millions of them, couldn't, couldn't have happened four years later. That's one thing. So, I mean, the tools and the stuff that was there, the, the, the network had grown bigger and more people using, using broad, had access to broadband. But then the, the way, um, you know, Facebook applications, the other amazing things that um, the Obama team built, taking advantage and understanding that there was a new way to do it, new politics versus, I think, a couple of the campaigns that were still sort of stuck in their old way. And, you know, you, the Clinton people, look, the way they had done it had worked for them in 92. They had won the presidency. It worked for them in 96. They had reelected the president of the United States. So they're, why would they, I mean, if, you know, looking at it from their view, you know, they didn't see a necessity to, 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 to uh, uh, use this stuff in a in a really different way. They weren't. They didn't need to. Which is the other thing that happens in these. Yeah, you know, it's the Kerry campaign didn't think it needed to either. Uh, four years earlier. So that's. I mean, that's one hypothesis there that the Dean campaign, as you're saying, like other cycles, helped create a framework that even in failure habituated uh, the the stakeholders and some of the power players to be more more receptive to this kind of campaign, the, this kind of activism. I, I just want to say though, there are other folks who say argue that in, in many ways, uh, even if it was uh, unfair, the Dean campaign's failure and the narrative of its failure, if anything, actually ultimately set participatory politics and some of this internet work back a little bit. And I just will give you one, so, and that's, uh, you know, only one piece of it, but the idea being that it didn't, didn't go as well. Go ahead, you wanna respond first? I think that's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, I just think that's absolutely ridiculous. And so, I think some of the very first people, I know, everywhere I went out there, I'd run into Dean people, I mean, <laughs> it, who would, like, come up to me and say, like, hey, you know, love you, you're great, or, you know, God, you're, what'd you do with all the money, or whatever the hell that was going through their heads, but they all said, they all do, you know, gosh, you know, I'm, I'm, I've signed up for Barack Obama, or Edward, I mean, they tended to be more Barack, some Edwards, and almost no Clinton, but, they were the first hundred, a few, they, they were really, I think, some of the first people out there fueling um, some of the Obama decentralized stuff. Uh, not that the camp, the campaign was doing amazing things, too. And, and the, you know, look, the candidate has a lot to do, do with this, obviously. I mean, I think, and I think Howard would be the first person to say Barack Obama was a better candidate than him uh, in terms of, you, you know, I mean, in terms of uh, sustaining, uh, you know, the candidacy all the way to the end. That doesn't, that you know that that doesn't mean that what happened in the Dean campaign somehow set the uh, set this back. I mean, it's like crazy. I just don't. I mean, like, yeah, I don't don't think that's real at all. Uh, I mean, I think uh, the opposite. I, I think part of the thing too was, I mean, there's a reason Joe was hired. Was yeah, it wasn't because it, it was it was because he wasn't in the. I mean, it was because he was in the Dean campaign. Went to the you know Blue State. All the experience they had, good or bad started in that, you know, I mean, we're, we're brilliantly in the Dean campaign, and yeah, sometimes I made a mistake, somebody else made a state mistake, we went th down the wrong road, but part of going down the wrong road makes it easier for the next guy, particularly if people like Joe were there, to go, I'm never doing the way Trippy did that, or whatever, you know what I mean, you know I mean, I mean, <laughs> well, right, so and that's like, well, that's, no, no, I'm just, no, but I'm being honest about well, it. Well, since it's we like, have everybody know, here, so, like, you know, what Joe, I mean, one, uh, item is that, you know, we have these comparisons and you've said and other people have said that, you know, the Dean campaign was like basically the Wright brothers at Kitty Hawk and the Obama campaign moved to this like Apollo level. Um, and, and Joe Rosebars who's with us, you know, when asked about that, he told Newsweek, well, not really if you consider that Kitty Hawk was a successful flight as compared to something that blew up on the fucking launch pad. 
Well, now, I don't think, to be fair, that he means that that it wasn't a step forward, but it was a big explosion, maybe. So, so how does that work? It's simple. We were trying to go from um, we were trying to go from a biplane to launching a rocket in 13 months. So we're sitting there. We got a little propeller and, a, and some flimsy wings, and we put a rocket on the back of the damn thing to try to launch to the moon and land in the White House, and the damn thing blows. I mean, I mean, first of all, I think it's ridiculous, and I don't, I'm not talking about Joe. I'm just saying, like, it. Look, there there is a campaign in which I believe everybody in the country, uh, you know, regardless whether they liked Howard Dean, didn't like him, liked Trippy, didn't like Trippy, who the hell cares about that? started something with th hundreds of thousands of people who started it too. I mean, it wasn't just, you know, but it was a campaign that was the first one to use, and by the way, very primitive tools. We didn't have YouTube. Facebook was on a few, was on college campuses, had never, had not yet really launched off of them, and by, the, and wasn't, in any case, wasn't populated by millions of people and didn't have it, and its API wasn't available to make an application with it. So, I mean, you're sitting there, and yeah, what I meant by that is we're sitting there, and we've got wooden propellers. They're the first wooden propellers anybody's seen. There's, you know, we, we've glued stuff on the wings. Um, we didn't start from Chicago, where there's a bunch of David Pluffs and David Axelrods. This guy's running from Vermont. It's anybody who got in their car and drove up there, and trust me, none of them would have gone. We tried. I mean, you know, not just Donna Brazil tried, you know, a whole list of people. So, uh, you know, my point isn't to defend the, the, the campaign so much as to say you, you got to a place where, um, um, and, you know, and, I mean, first of all, you get to a place where you have that relatively primitive technology, and Four years later, like I said, you have YouTube, you, you have Facebook, there are millions of people already on Facebook. I mean, the, the, the network in a lot of ways was already out there, and you had people who were more adept, three more years of knowledge under their belt, more code writing, uh, able to write, you know, have access to the API and go in and write an application. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's like saying, like, well, gosh, they did a bunch of brilliant stuff on the iPhone. Sure, we didn't have an iPhone. I mean, you know, I mean, it's like you know, that's what I meant about a pop. You know, they, yeah. they went from we went from we went from a bicycle to a Ferrari. You know, and they they drove the Ferrari faster and better than anybody's ever done, and innovated most of the Ferrari. I mean, that I didn't mean it as a hit. I meant it as like these are brilliant guys who did an amazing thing. If we're not the Wright brothers, I'm sorry. You, you know, I I think uh, the the Dean campaign was so. right. I have more questions that I solicited from some readers and people online, but I first want to open it up to people in the room, and then we'll, we'll maybe do both. So are there questions and comments here? Hi. Chuck DeFeo, as, as you know, yeah, yeah, sure, e-campaign sure, yeah. manager, Bush Cheney. You know, it, it almost sounds antiquated to, have this, to put this question out there. It, the model of what you guys were trying to do was an insurgency campaign. Right. And what we did at BCL4 was, much more, was a traditional, and this is an incumbent campaign, the, the incumbent president. When you look at what the model of e-campaigning is and how you guys made much more of a distributed, decentralized model, I, you know, there's some argument, it, even though it got you to where you needed to be, it wasn't sustainable in the long term. I mean, what are some of the lessons learned that you think moving forward, and what are the appropriate online campaigning models that you see moving forward? Even for either for, and maybe part of this question is for an incumbent Barack Obama. Well, well I mean, look, you have to, it's it does it's a candidate. It's a message in saying something, you know, and 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 people wanting to become part of that, uh, you know, matters. And I think. Um, I think it's easier to say, look, I could tell you exactly how I would have done the Clinton campaign. And, you know, the Clinton campaign, if she had started the campaign by, instead of saying, I want to have a conversation on the couch, it's sort of, you know, I mean, it was cooked. Uh, uh, I, you know, she could, have, she could have just said, look, you know, I'm running for president, and every woman within the sound of my voice knows we're not the status quo, we're change. And we have a different view, a different understanding of what it means to educate our, our kids in this war, not just this war, but all war, and save a, can a, a, a planet that's in trouble. Um, and I believe there are five million women within the sound of my voice 
who will contribute $100 to make real change in this country, change our politics, and, and change this country and change the world. Now, I firmly believe had she run that campaign, there would have been 5 million women who sent her 100 bucks. And I, it's not about the money. I know I talk about that a lot, but I'm use, it's always a lot of ways the easiest way for people to get it. it and what I'm saying, she chose to run the same, in a lot of ways, the same. I mean, she's a woman, damn it. She could have run. I mean, she was a somebody who's changed. She's locked into the experience thing. I don't understand what the hell those guys were thinking over there. Um, and, I'm, you know, I just don't. And, and most of them aren't here today, so you can't ask them. But, um, you, you know, I really think that you, it, President Obama is, is going to be, I think, the most powerful presidency that we've seen. Because it's him as an age, as a change agent with millions of Americans, directly connected to their president in a way that's never happened. There's been again, this is a totally new presidency, and we're going to be living under it not just during the Obama era, but into the future. Wait, one in the back. Uh, this is actually a little bit more about the, I guess, political environment than it is, uh, and I mentioned this in the last session, Joe, when you weren't here. Um, I, I'm operating under the theory that maybe the, the Democrats got a little lucky in terms of uh, coming back into power so quickly. You know, Dean laying the groundwork and then becoming DNC chair, you know, the, the web victory that put us at 50 in the Senate, um, you know, having a candidate like Obama who had to slug through primary, you know, anything goes wrong, these things goes wrong, maybe it takes an extra cycle or two for Democrats to come back to power. As the right looks to kind of have this own transformation of its own, you know, is the, the Democratic model maybe a little bit more on the lucky side and the shorter side than they may experience just uh, because of circumstances and may it take them a little bit longer through maybe no fault of their own? Well, I mean, look, macro, you know, history has a lot to do with this. And, and certainly all the things that uh, the various Joes did and the various Howard Dean and, you know, et cetera, did, um, in the end may not have had as much to do with it as a guy named George Bush did. Um, in other words, you know, there, he helped a lot. I mean, unfortunately, I don't mean this, you know, I mean, it's like here was a guy who, who just made enough Americans start to say, with a lot of help from documentarians and other, I mean, all this kind of stuff was going on that created an environment in which people realized the President of the United States was a liar, got us into a bunch of stuff that he shouldn't have gotten us into. I mean, and this is their feeling, and, that, and whether they thought he had lied to them or not, thought that he was a failed president. And, and they wanted to do something about it and got involved. And at the same time, Howard Dean was there, 50 state strategy, a lot of people who wanted to you know, t take their country back. All of this is, is going on. I think. The, the reality is they didn't need to do it. I mean, the, the reality is George Bush's pioneers and rangers, it, just like the Clinton can, campaign with Terry McAuliffe and the, the big donors in the Democratic Party, it had worked great for the Clintons in 92. It had worked great for, for Bush in 2000, and it worked great for him in 2004. So there was no, it wasn't, it's not that they don't know, you know, it's, it's that the, the infrastructure of their party the, the head of the party who actually kind of runs things, which in this case was the President of the United States. And, you know, even though I think Rove and Ken Melman and a lot of the people who were at the top at the time understood that there was a power, bottom up power of the internet and, and sort of played with it, to, I mean, for lack of it, they weren't as, they didn't, they weren't desperate to get to use it because they didn't need to. And so now, guess who's desperate to get it because they really need to? the Republicans. We, the, on the progressive Democratic side, are, we're, you know, gosh, we're, we won, we're, we're, we're smart, we've outmaneuvered them, we've got a big advantage, and that's how, over time, you, you know, they're, they're likely, it's like Ron Paul, why? Because out of desperation, it was the only, you know, only vehicle he had. So I think, you know, to say that conservatives, um, Republicans uh, won't, uh, won't move and start raising money and building infrastructure decentralized using the net and the tools, it's going to happen. Um, and then, you know, the, 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 the issues can, you know, where I think there is a small problem or a problem for them now is that if you start with a, a community of 13 million and over here is a community of, you know, at, you know, let's call it a million, 
and ask this thing, you know, the, the first mover thing, can you, um, you know, how fast can they, can they catch if, we, if the progressive side keeps moving? I don't know the answer to that. So far, I mean, in product stuff, it doesn't happen very often. I mean, you know, Amazon doesn't, you know, you know I'm saying, the, the network gets bigger. The, the other thing I'd say, and then I'll let go of that, is the more important thing, I think, is generational of what's, what's happened. I think because they failed in a lot of ways, didn't need to talk in a medium that younger people tend to use and talk, talk with. Again, you, earlier I was here for a few minutes when um, you talk about how people don't use e younger people don't use email. Um, they didn't, because Bush didn't need to do this stuff, and they, they sort of ignored that, a, a, and there was a lot of energy there against Bush in that generation, and to take the country back and, and to fix what the boomers and a lot of other people had screwed up. Um, it was, I think, a big pro becomes a bigger problem later on, because once a generation tends to vote in its early stages with a party or in a progressive or conservative direction, it usually stays that way. And so just like the Reagan era brought in, all the young people who were voting for the first time in the Reagan era became Republicans and stayed that way. One of the problems they now have is two cycles, 2000. For because of Wes Clark, Howard Dean, a lot of young people, three million more young people became Democrats that year. And then you saw the same kind of big growth, better growth with Obama. They did a much better job, grew it even, even more. There's now a generation that's a real problem long term for the Republicans right. and the conservatives. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Rob Farris from the Berkman Center. I was wondering what you thought the emergence of online tools would mean for the power of political parties. If you could look at one side, it would say better organizing tools would strengthen these existing institutions. On the other side, they're portable, and you could say that this is going to yeah. uh, suck, suck uh, power out of them. I, I think the parties are dead over the long haul. I don't mean that. I love my party. I'm not saying that disrespectfully. I just mean that that um, you, you you know there really is sort of Obama Democratic Party or maybe Dean. You know, I mean, I'm talking about Howard, not the. But I mean, sort of the 50 state Obama party party. Uh, the established Democratic Party sort of diminished in this election, and it you know really is about. In fact, that's who they beat. I mean the. The Clintons, you know, tended to have most of that uh, that party apparatus, and I just think you don't need it. I mean, if you can say something that gets thousands and then millions of Americans to join you, evangelize for you, decentralize, organize for you, um, it, contribute to you, um, the, you don't have the. I mean, there's only two or three reasons to be in a party, and one, the biggest one is the donor base of the party. <laughs> I mean, you, you know, that's, that's why you want to be there. And then, you, you know, the second one is, is sort of the organizational base of the party, which both parties have been, that's been, I mean, the, you know, the party boss, ward leaders, they only exist now in two or three cities. Um, and where they do exist, there tends to be a lot more corruption and stuff. So, I mean, uh, you know, so I'm not, I, I don't think those are going to re, 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 somehow get, Re-energized and revigorated, so reinvigorated. So, you know, look, you're losing the organizational strength and ability of these tools of people to use them together in their community, um, like the Obama campaign in particular did in a way we couldn't do. In not, I don't think we could have done it in time in in 2004. I mean, we just, you know, again, the other thing is we were doing this on the fly. I mean, just literally building the airplane while we were already moving down the runway, which is a bigger problem when you're, you know, YouTube was already there, Facebook was already there, millions of people already use them. We were, you know, when we did Dean TV, I think Dean TV had like 190,000 people kind of playing around with it, putting stuff up and watching stuff. You know, that was, you, in a weird way, YouTube before YouTube was YouTube. And it was populated, we're talking about 190,000 people on a good day, not, the millions that are on YouTube just by accident tomorrow, you know, so that mattered. I mean, we were building Dean TV as the run as we were rolling down the runway, you know. And did we waste time with that? Probably. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I don't know whether the hundred ninety thousand people, you know, were yeah. seeing that video and doing stuff with it. 
Uh, we'll go to one question online. I would also flag that I think Joe's speaking about the mass participation aspect of, of the decline of the power of the party, which yeah. I think is absolutely true. There's a counter trend, of course, at the, at the level of partisan identification among highly involved activists. And we've seen, I mean, the outsourcing of the DCCC's strategy to the net roots and the liberal blogosphere and the idea that you can pick, uh, you know, House and Senate candidates to affect the party clearly comes from people who are distributed around the country feeling a strong identification with not necessarily today's Democratic Party, but a Democratic Party that they want to build. But that, I don't think, competes with the numbers that are being drawn away well, in the trend you're talking about. Well, also, I mean, I just think that there's a chance, there's a, a decent chance that as, you know, not everybody's going to be Barack Obama. I mean, I'm, what I'm trying to say is, there, you know, neither of these parties have, like, decided they're going to change. I don't mean that the, the Obama era may be about change, and he may be about change, and the party may be different. But there is a chance that at the end of eight years, the country is saying, you know, we want, you, you know, we want somebody, something different again. And that may not, that may be an end of, I mean, a, a, a somebody who can, not, a, I'm not talking about a rich guy, I'm talking about somebody who can engender, you know, a bunch of small contributions and lift you know, uh, you know, get um, escape velocity and who's not a member of either party. I don't mm -hmm. mean it as a bad thing. I just think it's in the future. I don't mean they're dead tomorrow. We're all gone. The other thing that did happen, which I thought was really cool, was, you know, all of a sudden um, uh, at party central committee meetings uh, all over the country after the Dean campaign, the five regulars showed up for their yeah. meeting and all of a sudden there were 30 people that they had no clue who they were. Right. They were Dean or Wes Clark or other pe people, and they elected five new members of the Central Committee, and therefore there was a new and different Democratic Party. I expect that to really happen um, with the Obama uh, or this Obama campaign. So in the short time we have left, I'm going to take I'm two sorry. questions from, from, from beyond the room and then, and then end with some more questions in the room. Um, from Daily Coast, where we invited people to give questions. The first is from Delphil. Uh, ask him why he was such a pessimist on Daily Coast during the campaign. OMG, we're going to lose Ohio and so on. I hated his stupid diaries. <laughs> and wait. I don't remember the, saying that. <laughs> and, uh, and, the sec post it, right? and the second question, uh, well, but when you did, they read. Um, the second question is from Granny Helen. Conservatives derided McCain-Feingold because of the limits corporations could make to candidates under the philosophy that money equals and should equal speech. Did these conservatives have a point in our system, given Obama's success and where we're headed, does money equal speech, regardless of whether it comes from corporate America or small donors? Well, I don't, I mean, I don't think money equals speech, but that doesn't matter what I think. I mean, the, the, the Supreme Court's not going not gonna to stop, uh, not going to say you can't, you know, somebody can't spend millions of dollars saying, uh, you know, swift voting somebody or, or not. So I don't think that... Uh, I, my personal opinion about it doesn't really matter. On the, the oh my God, I mean, look, I, I think that there's a lot of uh, uh, stuff in the blogosphere where you say something because, like, you know, I, I mean, during the time where Hillary Clinton was ahead of everybody by a zillion percent, and um, you say, so, and maybe Obama wasn't even in the race yet, and you say, like, gosh, unless something happens here, Hillary Clinton's going to be the nominee. Oh, my God. And then, like, two years later, somebody says, geez, how come you were such a bummer on the Hillary Clinton thing? <laughs> like, at the time, I don't know. What, I don't even know what the hell the, there's, you know, the, 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 the diary said. I, you know, don't read my diary. You know, I mean, <laughs> shit. I don't get it. You know, like, uh, you know, why is he saying I already hated reading this stuff? Well, okay, don't read it. Well, Weirdest stuff. I mean, maybe he like, hated it and loved it all at the same yeah, time. Yeah, you know, maybe he yeah. loves to hate me. That's fine too. You know, I've got plenty of those, but that's right. It's right in front. You can't be killed. Hi, I'm Dana Fisher from Columbia University, and um, so you just were talking before the oh my god stuff about um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the parties being dead, and one of the questions I had if that's true, is where then do all these people who mobilize for Obama or mobilize for other campaigns, where is the lasting infrastructure then? And I was wondering if you could take your experiences from the Dean campaign and beyond it and project and think about if there really is a retraction in these parties, how do people stay connected together? Because 
for those of us who study civic engagement, the party provides the lasting, or it's supposed to provide the lasting contact for people. Well, I mean, I think, first of all, I think the, it's the, you know, look, as we were, you were talking about entertainment and his politics gets more like, I mean, look, it's the, the thing that holds it together is, is the personality. I mean, in other words, they, they, people were attracted to Howard Dean or attracted to something Obama said, not that they, I, I mean, I don't believe that, I mean, I think there were a lot of independents and a lot of Republicans that were attracted to Barack Obama and are in that 13 million people. A lot of them aren't, as Joe was saying earlier uh, in the, the panel that I was listening to, that, you know, they, they sort of almost changed what being a Democrat is. It didn't, you know, it wasn't like strong D, D. There was a lot of independents joining it. So I think, you know, increasingly it's, the, it's a personality that I mean, it's it's a human being, not the party that people are rallying around. Are you then saying it's charisma? I don't. I mean, I don't. It could be an issue. It could be. I mean, with Howard, I think it was a lot of his opposition to the war, a lot of his courage on 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 things that the that the Democratic establishment was thought he was crazy for saying, but um, and they, by the way, were helping to kill him. Most. I mean, you know, it wasn't like we were done in by the press. It was, you know, the establishment, the other candidates. But my, my point would be that, um, which, the, which was a different situation with Obama. You didn't see as much of that. He, he garnered enough uh, uh, people, I think, in the establishment of the party, had an, enough respect from them, um, possibly because he'd been in the Senate for a while and they'd actually gotten to know him. I mean, I'm not, but you know, Howard was, a Martian. I mean, for those people, I don't mean I think he was great. So, well, you, you got to be careful because then this ends up on a blog, and I called him a Martian, and then everybody is mad at me. So, well, people stopped but, reading your diaries when yeah, I told them to. So, please stop reading my diaries. We'll do. Okay. We'll go. Last question yeah. to yeah. meet up. Yeah. Hey, hey, Scott. Hey there, Joe. So, coming off of Dana's question, I thought what, what her, her question was really interesting. That that uh, you know the, that the part she says the the party is supposed to keep. Um, the party is supposed to keep uh, keep uh, things together, or the 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 uh, you know that that there's a function of of providing a, a, a structure, a foundation, an organization, and and yet and then you you said oh well, but it's personality and charisma. Isn't the um, you know what's your vision for in the 21st century? Is there such a thing as uh, as you know structure, organization, foundation beyond? Uh, is it just going to be in sort of OFA two land? Is there, uh, or is, I mean, is Clay Shirky right that the future of organizing is no, no organizations, no foundation yeah, or structure? Yeah, I think that's more right. I mean, let me give you an example. If the, the structured and established Democratic Party, I think, clearly wants Barack Obama to be one thing. And I think the, the people, or many of the millions of people, want him to pass an agenda of change. And... Are you know are sort of askance about you know what are all the party officials in Washington gonna how, how are they gonna muffle the change that, that we want and all I'd say is you know I give you an example I don't think this is gonna happen but if Barack Obama ten, it turns out to be you know more of the same just sort of the standard politics no change I mean let's I mean let's, let's like no change at all right it just stays the same I don't believe that's gonna happen. But if it did, you can't tell me that a third part that, that the millions of people don't say, "To hell with this." We tried the the Republicans for eight years. We tied, We thought Obama. We, we, we thought we'd elected change, and this guy was going to do it. He didn't. So, I think there will be there would be a hunger for now. This now all of a sudden the, this new guy or new woman who decides they're going to be in you know screw both parties. We need real change. I'm, I don't. I'm just saying I could see how I now believe that the structure's there, the tools are there, that if those kind of dynamics occurred, I think, yeah, there is no organization any, anymore. It's, it's an organization of millions of Americans who come together in common purpose in 2012 or 2016. It happened, I believe that's exactly what happened in 2008 around Barack Obama, who happened to be a Democrat, but who who won the election because it was not an organization, mean, it was the organization of those people. They, I mean, them doing it, they created their own party it, around 
Barack Obama who happened to be a Democrat. And I think that's what I, I maybe I didn't articulate the, the personality thing. I, I, I think like, you know, that's what it was. It was more millions of Americans connecting to each other, forming this organization around Barack Obama, and he happened to be a D. And many of them were not. Most of them were, but many of them were not. Great. Well, thank you, Joe, and thanks to everyone. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Good.